are these people? So this story, um, many of you, we've talked about Rwanda's genocide. We've talked about what's happening currently in Gaza and death. And we talked a little bit about Nigeria in the past in yeah. another segment. Um, but you may not know of these other genocides uh, that occurred in Iraq, Indonesia, and Zimbabwe. And as I said in our intro, these might be worth doing more deep dives on, uh, mm. maybe in the future. Um, so definitely let me know if you're interested in learning more about those, and we'll try and create segments around those uh, other countries. Um, but what these countries have in common in terms of their genocides is how another foreign power, another Western foreign power, has had its complicity in dealing with all of these countries. And it's, so it kind of gives a parallel to what the U.S. is doing now right. in terms of its complicity in what's happening in Gaza. Um, so that Western world power is the U.K., uh, okay. is what is mentioned in this segment. So... In order to learn more about these genocides, we will go to Declassified UK. Yep. This article is written by Mark Curtis, where he writes Gaza, Britain's seventh genocide. Since the 1960s, labor and conservative governments have supported or acquiesced in several cases of genocide across Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. So let's continue. Many people in Britain I speak to struggle to understand how their government can acquiesce in, still less support, Israel's genocide of Palestinians in Gaza. We see the killing, maiming, and destruction on a daily or even hourly basis in real time, knowing our government is complicit. It seems incomprehensible to many. But it's only hard to understand if one has a little knowledge of Britain's foreign policy in recent decades or an overly rosy picture of just what right hall stands for in the world. And if people do suffer from that historical ignorance, it is not their fault, but the fault of a media system that refuses to tell people the truth about our past as well as our present. The reality is that, tragically, the UK establishment complicity in genocide is nothing new. There is a long history to Britain backing forces committing genocide, defined as an attempt to destroy a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Two of the old, closest parallels to our current horror in Gaza come from the 1960s. So this is genocide one. Mm -hmm. The Labour government under Harold Wilson secretly armed and backed Nigeria's aggression against the secessionist region of the Bihadra during 1967 through 1970. This was a brutal genocidal campaign that produced the worst humanitarian crisis of that time. During the three years of war, up to three million people died as Nigeria enforced a blockade on Bifar, causing widespread starvation. Even as pictures of malnourished or dead children made it into the UK press, the British government rolled out significant public opposition to its policy of, constantly, of giving constant support to the Nigerian government. The public was right to protest because the declassified files later revealed just how complicit the British government was. Those documents show the U that UK ministers secretly provided large quantities of arms to Nigeria, helping facilitate its massacres. Sound familiar, people? They did so to, pres to preserve the unity of the country and curry favor with Nigeria's leaders, largely to promote British oil interests, especially those of BP and Shell. So, again, sound familiar, Reef? Yep. All right. Yes. So, um, so genocide two. Just before BFR, the British Conservative government armed another genocide in Iraq. UK ministers stepped up arms exports to Iraq's regime after it launched what British officials recognized as a terror campaign against the Kurds in 1963. Declassified files show that Britain sent thousands of rockets to Baghdad knowing that they would be used to destroy Turkish villages in the north of the country. British ministers also approved the export of hundreds of armored personnel carriers, which they recognized were possibly for use if needed against the Kurds. Alec Douglas Holm, Foreign Secretary in Harold Macmillan's government, 
was anxious that, in general, Iraq's arms requirements should be met as quickly as possible, one file reads. There are considerable commercial advantages to be gained, a ministerial committee stated, stated, and the scope of for military exports is considerable. In another echo of Gaza now, the British also attempted to ensure the United Nations would not discuss allegations of genocide in Iraq. <laughs> and by 1963, as the war continued, the new Labour government of Wilson was ignoring pleas from Kurdish leader Mustafa Baranzi to prevent Iraq beginning possible chemical weapons attacks against Kurds. So that's two. Uh, genocide free same place in Iraq. Right. A quarter of a century later, similar priorities emerged when Iraq's dictator, Saddam Hussein, launched another campaign of genocide against the Kurds. Most specifically, his forces used chemical weapons against the Kurdish town in Jalaba in March 1988, killing over 3,000 people. How yep. did the UK government under Margaret Thatcher respond? Five months after Halajaba, sorry, Iraq and Iran signed a peace agreement ending the long-running war between them. Although Whitehall condemned Saddam's chemical attacks, UK Foreign Secretary Jeffrey Howe noted in a secret report to Thatcher that opportunities for sales of defense equipment to Iran and Iraq will be considered. Well, keep in mind who put Hussein in power to begin with. You know, you can go right. and look at those Mujahideens and funded them and all that jazz. Um. One, foreign, foreign foreign mis, one foreign office official noted, it could look very cynical if, so soon after expressing outrage about the treatment of the Kurds, we adopt a more flexible approach to arms sales. This didn't matter. The UK had already provided an array of arms to Saddam during the early 1980s. In October 1989, Foreign Minister William Waldengrave noted that, I doubt if there is any future market of such a scale anywhere where the UK is potentially so well placed. He added, the priority of Iraq in our policy should be very high. UK had by then already enrolled numerous British companies to exhibit equipment at the Baghdad Arms Fair in 9th, April 1989, attended also by weapons salesmen from the government's Defense Exports Services Organization. Human Rights Watch documented the campaign of extermination against the Kurds of northern Iraq during 1987 through 1989, concluded that this resulted in the wholesale destruction of 2,000 villages and the forced displacement of hundreds of thousands. So. Yep. All right. Uh, let's go to genocide number four. The previous decade had witnessed another of the post-war war world's worst mass killings, when the Indonesian military regime under General Sutaro, Suharto brutally invaded the territory in the East Timor in 1975. The declassified files show that Wilson government backed the invasion. Britain's ambassador in Jakarta, John Ford, wrote, Certainly, as seen from here, it is in Britain's interest that Indonesia should absorb the territory of East Timor as soon and as obtrusively as possible. If it comes to the crunch and there is a role in the United Nations, we should keep our heads down and avoid sliding against the Indonesian government, he added. This is what the UK did, and around 200,000 Timorese were killed in the next few years. Wilson's successor as Prime Minister James Callaghan proceeded to sell combat aircraft to Indonesia, which were used in its ongoing repression campaign and to help defeat a popular movement for Timorese independence. Right. I mean, it just it just sounds like, I mean, we've covered this in Papua New Guinea now too, right? Yeah, so that's pretty much the sale of arms has been used in genocidal acts in right. I mean, almost everywhere in the global south at this point. Pretty much. So, yeah. All right, genocide number five. Um, British policymakers had a hand in two other genocides, both in Africa, which had also passed into the historical memory hole. Newly independent Zimbabwe under Robert Mutambe conducted atrocities against the 
in the GLA, people of oh boy. Mugabe as the Indebel, Indebeli. Oh, the other one, Matabeleland. Yeah, Matabeleland. Yeah, in the southwest of the country, in a series of mass killings between 1983 for 1987. Documents show UK officials and the British military advisory training team on the ground had detailed knowledge of the Matabeleland massacres, which resulted in the death between 10,000 and 20,000 people. Yet those officials minimized the magnitude of the atrocities and chose to adopt a policy of willful blindness towards them. Britain was motivated by maintaining the training team in the country and nurturing a positive relationship with Mutambe, Mugambe, somewhat ironical as Zimbabwe's authoritarian leader soon became the UK's bet noir. Um, a decade later, an even more calamitous genocide occurred. The Rwanda slaughter of 1994 is perhaps the best known recent case of genocide to the general public, but the UK role in it is still not widely understood. After the killing, so this is six, after the killings of members of the Tutsi ethnic group began in Rwanda in early April 1994, the UN Security Council, instead of beefing up its peace mission in the country and giving it a stronger mandate to intervene, decided to reduce their troop presence from 2,500 to 270. It was Britain's ambassador to the UN, Sir David Hannay, who proposed that the UN pull out its force, to which the US agreed. This decision sent a green light to those who had planned the genocide that the UN would not intervene. A small UN military force arrived merely to rescue expatri expatriates and then left. Belgium's mm. senior arm Army officer in UN peace mission believed that if its force had not been pulled out, the killing could have been stopped. Canadian General Romeo Delare, who commanded the UN force in Rwanda, later said that its evacuation showed inexcusable apathy by the sovereign states that made up the UN. That is completely beyond comprehension and moral acceptability. By May 1994, with perhaps hundreds of thousands already dead, there was another UN proposal to dispatch 5,500 5, troops to help stop the massacres. This deployment was delayed by pressure mainly from the US ambassador with support from Britain. Dr. Claret believes that if these troops had been speedily deployed, tens of thousands more lives could have been saved. Similar to the present day in Gaza and Iraq in the 1960s, British officials went out their way to ensure the UN did not use the word genocide to describe the slaughter in Rwanda. This would have obligated states to prevent and punish those guilty. So, again, we've talked about Rwanda in depth. Uh, yeah. I spent some time in Rwanda uh, a few years ago, um, and that genocide was close to a million uh, within three months, dead. So, just to give you some context of that, for those of you who haven't been uh, are new to the show. Um, in late April 1994, a Security Council resolution drafted by the UK that rejected the use of the term genocide was passed with support from the US and China. A July 1994 resolution spoke of possible acts of genocide, and other Security Council documents used similarly restrained language. The role of the West in Rwanda's genocide has been carefully documented by journalist Linda Melvern, but still largely escapes media coverage in anniversaries and references. Well, I would argue here at least um, that we don't cover it. But in in Rwanda, they memorialize the uh, genocide every year from April to July. So right. you know, so it, it's not that it's not covered. It's just that the our media avoids covering it uh, for obvious reasons. So. Um, how is it that UK governments can be consistently complicit in genocide overseas? The principal reason is that they are not motivated by concerns about international law or supporting human rights. These principles might occasionally inform policy making at the margins, but only when there are no other higher priorities to be pursued, such as securing oil interests, arms exports, or geopolitical gains. Lar high moral principles are largely espoused only for the cameras and complicit journalists who regularly parrot them as though they are important to Whitehall planners. 
In reality, the UK is concerned about the law and rights only when it comes to enemy states as a means to pressure and isolate them for public relations purposes. Another factor is that ministers are never held accountable for their complicity in crimes overseas, and therefore there is no deterrent for current ministers. They know they can get away with it. We're looking at you, Blinken. Um, indeed, this impunity is built into the British system. The UK's unwritten constitution is permeated by the concept of crown immunity. This deems that ministers cannot commit a legal wrong and do not act as persons but as agents deep with crown authority and are therefore untouchable under the law. If a minister breaches the criminal law outside of his public duties, he is sub subject to criminal law like everyone else. But if she makes decisions as a minister, however irreprehensible and or incompetent, these are yeah. considered as acts of government and not for the criminal courts. This is why the ICC and other world bodies are needed to hold British ministers to account for their complicity in war crimes as now over Gaza. Well, and even that's like, uh, you know, right, like not okay. much power does the ICC have right. to actually do stuff with. Right. They're just basically more an advisory group of that can make yeah. a recommendation, but nothing is necessarily enforced. Right. Um, in the case of Gaza, Palestinians are seen as unpeople, since supporting them holds a little merit or gain for British planners. What does Palestine have to offer Whitehall in comparison with Israel? In supporting Israel, Whitehall can demonstrate British subservience and usefulness to its major ally, the US. Israel is a buyer of British arms, a strategic ally to police the region, and an increasingly, albeit still, scroll down. Oh, sorry. Too much. Too much. No. Yeah, a bit still fairly small trade planner, partner. And a quarter of the UK's entire parliament of MPs have received funding from the Israeli lobby. Yep. Buying an influence over UK policy making that is way beyond anything the Palestinians can induce. Unless and until we make our government system promote basic moral values and hold elected officials to account for crimes abroad in a democratic way, the UK will keep acquiescing in genocides in decades to come. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like overall this is preaching to the choir, but, you know, in the way that you know, in the past at the UK. And again, I didn't even know most of these genocides that the UK um, has committed. But I, gave, I, but I did this as a parallel to kind of show that the US has had perfect Declass practice in terms of... We brought declassified stuff on to, about ahead. their, like, uh, you know, we talked about their bombs still killing people now because they left them on exploded and you know testing facilities and you know that colonial grip is still pretty strong in a lot of these places so right. and we're seeing that with with bricks too honestly you know capitalism still being a part of that too so ugh, i mean you know, I'm surprised. I'm I'm sure there's more than seven Britain's been a part oh, of. Oh yeah, too. for sure. And so, as I said, this is probably, this will probably be worth a deep dive, maybe in the future, like yeah. to kind of look into some of these um, genocides more in depth. But you know, what kind of struck me was, I think, in people's mind, the reason why, and this is just a guess, the reason why that genocide is not necessarily thrown about too much is because I think people have a certain number in terms of how many people have to die in order for it to be a genocide. So in this case, for a lot of these cases, it's been around what, like 40,000 at minimum, at least from what, you know, kind of what we read, which is about what, well, what is being reported in Gaza right now, but more likely than a lot more than that. So right. it doesn't take many people dying in order to commit genocide. It's just the intent of actually trying to kill off like a people group. So, yep. but, you know, but I read that I thought this was interesting in terms of 
you know, the idea that people are, are thinking or now kind of facing the idea of, oh, we have to vote for Kamala because one, Trump is much worse. And then the stupid theory that people have, oh, we can push our left on the issue. Like, you know, you're going to try and push her on the issue after you give away your vote. Makes no damn sense to me. Yeah. So, but it just kind of proves that, you know, once again, Israel has a hand in interfering with our politicians' thought processes that they're not going to do anything. And you're going into voting for Kamala in the hope that she actually will do something when she's given no indication that she will. So mm -hmm. in that scenario, it doesn't matter if you have Trump or her. You know, both of them are going to be complicit in the genocide that's occurring. The only difference is, is that Kamala might give some niceties somewhat to people. But, you know, again, she we know that she... Uh, is tied to the Israeli lobby, especially given her husband is also a raging Zionist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so, I mean, yeah, it's just funny that the excuse that people have is that we can push her is really ridiculous. Especially, yeah, just like, like they did with it, the fucking last nine Democrats. Like, okay, I ain't buying right. that shit. Good luck with that. So, right. Um, I mean, they, the best you get from from them is we are deeply sorry. That's, that's Basically. about it. So, but yeah, I mean, same stuff as always: more death and destruction caused by us. So, you know, well, the UK, but we're also complicit. But you know, oh, England, we so if. If you're interested in more stories like these, you can use your phone to scan the QR code uh, that you see on your screen, or you can go to the link uh, at on the bottom of your screen. If you're in chat right now, if you don't remember the link, you can type explanation point donate, and it will pop up in the chat, and then you can give that way. Um, so as we keep saying, and I forgot to say earlier in the show, and now, given that tomorrow's Halloween, it basically is holiday season. So, you know, we know people are going to be starting to buy gifts and food and all the things over the next couple of months. So, we know for many people, money will be kind of tight. Um, so, we always say take care of your families, take care of yourselves, take care of your communities first before you give to us. But we will appreciate any extra money, even if it's much as a dollar. Uh, to help us continue to grow this network and to grow this channel. Uh, and so that we're able to continue to produce the segments that we do produce. Uh, let us know in the comments if you're interested in learning more about these other genocides that we kind of talked about in this segment. And please don't forget to like. Uh, that's very helpful with the algorithm, although I'm fairly certain YouTube doesn't care. But at least we can feed the lie that it does help at least us uh, and to fight the suppression that we do see on the platform. And be sure to make a comment. We do read them. Uh, we do respond to them more often than not. And as we, a lot of your ideas for segments actually come from your comments. So we do, we do appreciate that feedback so that we're able to create the content for you uh, and help us get to free K. Uh, we've been growing kind of steadily over the last few months. And we hope we can get to free K at some point next year. And thanks for watching. Thank you.